Now that we have this new quantum mechanical tool in our toolbox, let's look at the simplest molecule, H2+. We start here because we can solve the Schrodinger equation analytically for this scenario, since it only has one electron shared between two nuclei. The Hamiltonian for this system is expressed as minus h bar squared divided by 2 times the mass of the nucleus times the Laplacian for nucleus A plus the Laplacian for nucleus B minus h bar squared divided by 2 times the mass of the electron times the Laplacian for the electron minus the elementary charge squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times the distance between the electron and nucleus A minus the elementary charge squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times the distance between the electron and nucleus B, plus the elementary charge squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times the distance between the two nuclei. The Hamiltonian is a combination of potential and kinetic energy terms for all the particles involved. In total, we have three kinetic energy terms, one for each nuclei and one for the electron, as well as three potential energy terms, which represents the electrostatic interaction between each of the three particles. It is convenient to simplify the Hamiltonian to only include the part that will help describe the chemical bond between the two nuclei. To this end, we will apply the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. It is based on the fact that the nuclei are so much more massive than the electron and therefore move much more slowly. The electron can adjust instantaneously to any motion of the atoms. As a result of these two rates of motion, we can separate the wave function that represents the molecule into two parts, those that describe electronic motion and those that describe nuclear motion. The electronic wave function will tell us about bonding, and we have already solved problems focusing on the nuclear motion as it relates to vibrational and rotational spectroscopy. Since the electronic wave function only depends upon the position of the electron and the internuclear separation, capital R, which we will assume is fixed, the kinetic energy of the nuclei terms in the molecular Hamiltonian evaluate to zero. This means that when focusing on the electronic parts of the wave function, we can redefine the Hamiltonian to be minus h bar squared divided by 2 times the mass of the electron times the Laplacian for the electron minus the elementary charge squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times the distance between the electron and nucleus A, minus the elementary charge squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times the distance between the electron and nucleus B, plus the elementary charge squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times the distance between the two nuclei. Now that we have our Hamiltonian, we will guess as to the form of our wave function solution so that we can apply the variational principle to determine the energy of the system. We will reasonably assume that the wave function that describes our bond is a linear combination of the 1s orbital centered on both nuclei, meaning the electronic wave function is equal to Ca times psi 1s centered on nuclei A plus Cb times psi 1s centered on nuclei B. As we will see, there are going to be two electronic psi solutions that satisfy the Schrodinger equation. Each of these solutions are called molecular orbitals. In general, molecular orbitals can be made up of a linear combination of atomic orbitals. Individual atomic orbitals used to build molecular orbitals are called basis functions, while the set of all atomic orbitals used is called a basis set. So we have our guess wave function solution, which is the psi El is equal to Ca times psi 1sA plus Cb times psi 1sB. And really this is just an admission that our bonding that occurs between our atoms are in the ground state, our electron lives in a 1s orbital on these protons. And so then it's going to be a mixture of the 1s orbital on one of the nuclei and the 1s orbital on the other nuclei. The Ca and the Cb, these are our variational parameters. And so these are the things that we're going to be minimizing over as we go through this process of trying to solve for the bonding and antibonding orbitals for this case, or as we look to find what is our wave function solutions for this problem. And so if you recall from the previous day, we calculate the energy via our variational principle by saying this expression up here, which is basically just a rearrangement of the, the Schrodinger equation, where we have the energy from our wave function or a trial wave function is equal to 
the integral over all space of our trial wave function or the complex conjugate of our trial wave function times the Hamiltonian applied to our trial wave function. And this is divided by the integral over all space of our trial wave function times its complex conjugate. And then again, of course, we're going to follow these five steps that we followed last time, which is basically just breaking down this process of first finding the numerator, which is this first piece, then finding the denominator. Then we're going to put them together so we can solve for the energy of this. We then are going to take the derivative of, of this energy expression with respect to both variational parameters so that we can minimize this energy expression. And then from that, we're going to determine the energy of our wave function. So starting with step one, this is now calculating the numerator of this expression. And so that just means I'm going to be doing the integral over all space, which I'm going to just simplify by just writing one integral for the time being. But it represents the integral over all space. And I'm going to take the complex conjugate of my trial wave function solution. I'm going to have the operator, the Hamiltonian. And then I have my trial wave function solution. And so my next step is just to substitute in what my trial wave function solution is. So again, the integral over all space. For this complex conjugate, we're going to assume the constants are real, so there's no difference, so it's just Ca. But this is going to be times the complex conjugate of the 1s orbital centered on atom A. With that, I'm going to have plus Cb times the 1s orbital over top of atom B, the complex conjugate of it. I'm going to have my Hamiltonian, and then I'm just going to put in my trial wave function solution, Ca times psi 1s A plus Cb times psi 1s B. My next step here is then to just do a distributive type principle, where I'm now just going to take my Hamiltonian, and I'm going to just operate it towards the right on the term that I have on the right. So again, I have my integral over all space. I'm going to have Ca times psi 1s A, the complex conjugate of it, plus Cb times psi 1s B, the complex conjugate of it. And then inside here, I'm going to get Ca times the operator applied to 1s A, plus Cb times the operator applied to psi 1s B. And again, I can pull my constant out front because it's not affected by the operator. But again, I have to keep the operator to the left because it's operating on each of these wave function solutions. The next step is to FOIL these two terms. So I have my integral over all space. And what I'm going to have is Ca squared times the complex conjugate of 1Sa. And I'm going to have the Hamiltonian applied to 1Sa. And to that, I'm going to have adding the integral over all space. Ca times Cb. I'm going to have the complex conjugate of 1sA with the Hamiltonian applied to 1sB plus the integral over all space Ca Cb. I'm going to have the complex conjugate of 1sB. I'm going to have the Hamiltonian and that's applied to the wave function for 1sA. And then finally I'm going to have the integral over all space of Cb squared times one or psi 1sb, complex conjugate, Hamiltonian applied to 1sb. Now for the purposes of demonstrating how we get to molecular orbitals, I'm not going to explicitly evaluate all of these integrals. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call these various integrals or the solutions of these various integrals just capital letters that represent that have subscripts that are dependent upon which nuclei they are associated with. So the integral of psi star um, of 1sA with the Hamiltonian applied to psi 1sA, I'm just going to call this HAA just to represent the answer for that, that integral. And that because the CA squared doesn't, isn't affected by the integral, I can pull it up front, then I'm going to have a CA squared that's going to appear beside it. I'm going to do the same thing for this term. For the second term, I'm going to say the integral of the complex conjugate of 1sA um, with the Hamiltonian applied to 1sB. I'm just going to call this HAB. And of course, with this guy, I can also have the constants come out front, so I'm going to have a CACB that's associated with this one. This term right here, the complex conjugate of 1sB with the Hamiltonian and 1sA, that integral over all space, I'm just going to call that answer HBA. 
And of course, again, with this, I've got the two constants C, A, C, B, which they can appear up front of the integral, so I'm just going to attach them to the front. And then finally, this last one, I'm going to write it as this psi star 1SB with the Hamiltonian of 1SB. I'm going to write this as HBB. And of course, the two constants CB squared will appear out front. We're also going to simplify this further. As a brief aside, the 1S orbital, if I were to write it out, it would just simply be 1 over the square root of pi times 1 over a naught 3 halves e raised to the power of negative r over a naught. And what you can see here is that this would be then the exact same if it was the complex conjugate, only because there's no complex term that's involved in this integral. So what that means is that in these terms where we're dealing with 1sA and 1sB as mixed terms, so say these two terms right here, what we can see is that the 1sA star is the same as 1sA, and the 1sB star is the same as 1sB. And so what we just determined a second ago with this Hermitian property is that since the Hamiltonian is a Hermitian operator, then we can reverse the order in which we apply the Hamiltonian. And so what that means is that these two values, this HAB and this HBA, they're actually the same. They will evaluate to the exact same, um, the exact same term. A similar argument can actually be made for HAA and HBB, that these two terms are actually the same as well. And this is also because we're substituting in the exact same expression into both of these, and they're evaluating psi star h hat psi with each other. And so the upshot of all of this is that if we can make HAA equal to HBB and HAB equals to HBA, then we can simplify this expression so that we have, if we were to just write all of them as HAA and HAB, then we can have CA squared HAA plus, and we're going to have two terms because again, HAB and HBA are the same. So I've got CACB plus CACB and an HAB. So two times CACB HAB. And then finally at the end, if we let HAA be the same as HBB, then we can write CB squared HAA because instead of it being HBB, we're just going to call it HAA, because they're equivalent.